Hello and welcome to Ask Echo Meter. My name is Carrie Ann Taylor, and along with myself from Echo Meter, we have uh, Gustavo Fernandez, and he is excellent on our chat and Q&A session time. We have Dr. Tony Podio and Lynn Rowland, who will be presenting the first part of the session today. And you see Dieter Becker there, he can give you a little wave. So for the first part of the session, we're going to talk about some of the basics. We're going to talk about the basics of acquiring with a PRT and a load cell, and then some of the features and acquisition types of acquisitions that you can do with those sensors. And then for the second part of the session, we're going to walk, sort of talk through the dynamometer workbook that we have. And so we've got 10 scenarios, and I have the data sets to go along with those in the TAM examples. And so out on our website, on our Ask Echo Meter webpage, you can download uh, a PDF bundle that um, includes a PDF of today's presentations as well as some of the technical papers that we're going to reference. And then there's another bundle that you can download that has the TAM example folders and then the workbook. And so probably after the session, I'll, I'll post the workbook with the answers in it as we kind of go through. But we're going to do some handoffs today between presenters, so please just bear with us. This, this workshop works great in person, and so we're excited to, to try it online today. So with that, Lynn, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Carrie Ann. Today, the title is Dynamometer Workshop, and if you uh, don't have the TAM software on your computer, you can go to the Echometer webpage and download that and install the, the TAM software on your computer, and then the examples that Carrie Ann will upload will be can be imported into the TAM program, and you can uh, follow along with the workbook and look at what we what we do. So I want to thank Carrie Ann and Gustavo and Dr. Podio for uh, participating in this presentation today. So the idea of uh, dynamometer data on rod pump wells has been a concept for a long time, many years. My first introduction to that was with the uh, liter dynamometer, uh, probably about 1980, so it wasn't 1950, but there was another device that I never really used called a Johnson Fag, but I used uh, and helped use and watch people use and use the data from a liter dynamometer. Now, those are all mechanical devices, and those have have uh, been replaced with uh, uh, high-speed, high-resolution uh, electronics uh, that has both the acquisition of the data electronically and the display of the data with computers and it's a very quick and it's safe and it's easy to use compared with the uh, liter dynamometers. One of the first uh, presentations that had uh, downhole pump cars in it was uh, back in 1936 when a shell engineer named Gilbert had built a downhole load cell and he would install the load cell in the rod string. This is a rod string here and then it had a had a, a, a thin metal brass card that a pin would scratch a trace on it, both the position and the load. And so this is an example of a pump card with, uh, that was recorded with the downhole dynamometer. And it's this instrument set right above the pump. And it's a pump, that, a pump dynamometer card that has gas interference. And so this was the early development. So the concept of the load the pump applied to the rod spring has been around since the 30s and maybe even before that. Now this is a picture of the liter dynamometer and this is the one that uh, that our company Amrata Hess used. I worked for Amrata Hess prior to 2000 when I started working for Echometer in 2000. But it has two hydraulic pistons. You put it in a spacer that's uh, between the polyester clamp and the carrier bar and you would pump this handle up and down and that would apply hydraulic pressure to push those pistons out and lift the rod string and then during the stroke it would it would have a little uh, pin or a, this is a wax card a little, little pin would scratch in the surface of the wax card and you get a, a trace of load versus position and I and I thought incorrectly that was that was very accurate load cell and we found that 
the loads could be off as much as 40 percent due to hysteresis because these pistons here had the little letter cups on them that would um, cause drag and uh, the, 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 the actual spring that we had in here for a calibrated spring uh, didn't know that there was drag on the piston so so it wasn't quite as accurate as we thought now this is a picture of a dynamometer card so the trace of the this is this is the stroke upstroke here and the downstroke and this line is the the trace that you would then take a uh, one hundredth of an inch scale ruler that you would then measure from this zero load line up to these points to find the peak load minimum load you'd, you'd use a planimeter to find the area and it takes you maybe um, 15 to 30 minutes to analyze just one stroke so that has really changed once computers have come in and now we can analyze uh, many many strokes in a very short time with the computer computer software so Echometer has uh, several types of uh, dynamometers that we use with our portable well analyzer. We have the devices that clamp on called the polish rod transducer. This is a wireless polish rod transducer. Uh, this is a wired polish rod transducer. And these two uh, devices um, we'll talk about, they measure the diameter change of the polish rod. And the polish rod is actually the load cell. And we're measuring the change in diameter of the polish rod, and that, that becomes your load based on um, some information about the, the polish rod and the diameter change. We'll talk about more. So these, these load cells here are called horseshoe load cells. And the, these two are wireless. This is a 50,000 uh, pound max horseshoe load cell. This is 30,000 pound. This load cell is like four inches tall. This is three inches tall. This is the same height as this wireless load cell. These are called 30K load cells. Uh, the advantage of the 50K load cell is there's a, there can be a, a jack attached to the bottom of the load cell. And then you would place this war, these two washers in this space along with this spool around the polish rod. And then you could just walk up. The spool is uh, 5 inches tall. And the load cell total height, height is 4.9 inches tall. And it sit, easily slips in this gap. So load cells are calibrated, they're accurate, they weigh you, they can weigh you just like they weigh the rod string. Extremely accurate, um, easy to use, except if you use a 30K load cell, so you have to stack the well off. Now another option you will talk about is you can use your, your own uh, pump-off controller type of uh, load cell that's already mounted on your well. You can get your load from your load cell and the acceleration from our wired accelerometer special or uh, the PRT if you would like. Now, the load cells are very accurate. The, the PRT can be accurate, but it also is affected by the bending of the polish rod. So this is a picture of the surface card and pump card in TAM. And we have the uh, reference load lines we talked about last week, plot, plotted on the pump card. The pump card for Echometer's effective load pump card. It sets on the zero load line on the downstroke and we have the valve open and close points uh, annotated on the pump card. Uh, this pump card is gas interference. It's anchor tubing. Uh, it's not very much load on the rods from the pump, and so there's a high fluid level in this well. The distance from here to here represents the the, the pressure of the load being picked up by the by the well to lift the fluid to the surface, and this just represents the lift to the surface by the pump. We typically use the surface card to analyze rod loading, uh, beam loading, torque calculation. We, the pump card, uh, used to analyze and troubleshoot the well, and it represents the, the load that the pump applies to the bottom of the rod string throughout the stroke. Now this is an example of the polish rod transducer, the wireless one that, that this is Ken Skinner, and he's attached to the well. And you can see that there's uh, three buttons here, and there's an on button, and we can use this these buttons to uh, turn the PRT on, and the software, TAM software, knows that the that the wireless system's on, and then it communicates back and forth, and you can adjust the tightness with a handle, and the lights will flash green when it's properly tightened. You typically want to put this polyfluoride transducer about six rod diameters below 
the polish rod clamp so that the stress lines are uniform. It's a very fast and convenient, uh, accurate device. Um, most operators prefer this because it's so fast and quick to use. Uh, this is a little video here of the us attaching the PRT and here I'm running the software down here and here's a video of Ken attaching the, the, the uh, PRT to the well and so I just started the PRT and it's supposed to be in sync here and um, you can see the screen's changing I'm, I've gone to select the test I'm selecting the test and now I'm going to acquire data and I'm going to click this button this is a wired the wired equipment in TWM is a wired system. It says it's an inch and a half polish rod. And okay, here's the, here's the uh, it's reading polish rod 15, output. 5. And down they, they're not quite in sync here. So I'm going to get Ken to walk up here. We're down lower. I keep on talking. It's 6.5 inches. Okay. Yeah, it's not quite. Too much. Minus 2. Loosen up a little bit. All right. So here we go. So Ken's. He's, less. he's putting it on, I'm going to look down, perfect. start to tighten the handle. And the disadvantage of the wired system is there's going to be two people or you have to turn your laptop so you can see the screen. So we're going to get the acceleration okay. yeah. from the po polytrod transducer and the diameter change from the polytrod transducer. And once he's got it tightened, he'll take the cable and it tends to wrap it around the handle so it won't cause a problem uh, when it's pumping. So that's a quick video of using. Now this is this is us out the well, attaching the wired wireless PRT to the well, and you can hear the wind noise, and you can hear Ken, and I'm saying, hey Ken, look at the screen. He says, no, I don't have to look at the screen because if I just tighten the handle, I can see that it's properly tightened without looking at the screen. So that's one of the advantages of the wireless equipment is that you can see that it's tightened without walking them back and forth between the computer and the well. So it's, so it's much quicker. Now here's looking at the screen in TAM, and so we selected the, the wireless PRT, and we're going to go to uh, uh, acquire data and set, set the PRT up. And so I'm going to click on this, uh, we've got it selected to acquire data, dynamometer data in TAM. And I'm going to come over here and click on this setup button. And then the same thing will happen, except now I'll be looking at the screen, and the screen will show that the output of the PRT is close to 15. And then as you gradually tighten it, this number is going to drop. Uh, and once this line gets in green, the, the PRT, the wireless PRT will show a green light, and you wouldn't have to see this. But if you had a wired a PRT using TAM, then it would work the same way as the TWM software would just worked, and we'll see this line, see it's starting to starting to reduce, get smaller. As you tighten up, the output's going smaller and smaller, getting close to zero, and once it gets in three, it's going to move and center this bar, and you can say, aha, now I've got this line centered for this inch and a quarter polish rod, and I'm ready to start acquire data, and it's also, the, the wireless system has a GPS, and if you're, if you're, if you've tagged your well, it knows that you're near a well and you can it'll actually open the well file for you and to find the to find the well that's within I think 250 feet. So now I say continue and I start ready to start acquiring data in TAM. And this is a raw data screen that's showing the the the, the load on the top in thousands of pounds. You can choose whatever units you want here. And this is the acceleration of the polish rod. And then we'll process the acceleration along with the load. Uh, determine the acceleration will determine the velocity and then determine the position and then once we have the uh, position for a stroke then we'll be able to uh, put that along with the load and we'll have a surface dynamic card and then after about two strokes TAM will start drawing the real-time plot of surface surface load and calculate the pump card so here's our surface load in TAM in real time being measured and displayed from the acceleration of the polish rod and the diameter change of the polish rod using the polish rod transducer. And the, the main difference, that was, what the main thing I was trying to show here was that you can attach the PRT and use the software to adjust it tight, or you can use the 
uh, buttons on the wireless transducer to adjust the tightness of the PRT and not and not have to walk back and forth between the software and the and the laptop. It, it's it, it's it's more productive. You save time. Now, a lot of times I get questions about the idea of how the PRT works, and so I added this little section here, and I'm going to go through and just make these bullet points. But it, it when you think about the polished wire transducer. You can hold it in your hand, and it's not exactly a load cell. It's a it's a diameter measurement change device. And so, if we know the diameter of the polish rod, and we know Poisson's ratio and the modulus elasticity, and the air and the area of the polish rod, then we can calculate with a change in load. We can calculate the change in change in diameter, we convert that to change in load. And so the TWM software then uses the weighted rods and fluid and it adjusts it for being uh, vertical. So if it's laying, if it's in a DVA well, it's going to take out some of the weight of the rods on the side that lay on the side of the tubing. But the PRT doesn't measure the weight of rods and fluid, it measures the change in load. And so we calculate with the TAM software all the way down to the end of the rod string. And so we convert the surface change in load to pump change in load versus stroke. And then we look at the, the, the zero load line. And we say on the downstroke, when the trailing valve has opened, then there's very little load if the fluid is not very viscous acting across the trailing valve. And we set the pump, the pump card on zero, and that determines the zero offset that then shifts the surface, surface card up to the uh, accurate and reasonable loads. And so this is this is an example here that kind of shows that idea. So this data was acquired with a PRT and it had a severe tag. And long ago we would set the pump card on zero based on the minimum load. And that became obvious in some cases that, that wasn't working. And so now the way this soft the TDM software works, TAM software works, is we look for the, the here it's got the valve open and close points noted. When the trailing valve opens, we say the plunger starts to move. And when the, when the velocity is the highest after the trailing valve opens, then we, play, we make that be the zero load for the polished rod transducer. So in this case, the minimum load is zero. In this case, we, the computer moved the pump card to zero load based on trailing valve open. So if, you're, if TAM doesn't position the trailing valve open line, this, this effective travel, trailing valve open line right here, to where the, where the trailing valve opens, so we have the effective plunger travel identified with the trailing valve open at that point, you need to, to display the valve open points and grab that line and move it to the appropriate point. This is the 30K load cell, and this is a uh, pumping unit at the University of Texas upon the top story of the petroleum department many years ago, and we this 30K load cell was used to uh, measure the loads at the surface along with the accelera acceleration. And it's a very precise load cell. It can measure loads down to a hundredth or a thousandth of a pound. We don't need to have that kind of resolution, but uh, when you start sampling at high speed, the resolution drops, and it's, it's good to have a high resolution uh, uh, load, load cell when you're starting to sample at 480 or 240 samples a second for sudden impact loads, trying to resolve sudden impact loads. Uh, so this is just this, this is works the same as a PRT, except that it actually has the output of the the true load, and we are weighing the rod string with this load cell. Uh, and it, but it must be stacked off. We have to put the 30k load cell uh, between the polish rod clamp and the carrier bar. So here is a picture of the well that we typically go to at near Echometer's office when we teach classes is called the V11 well and we've stacked off the the this is there's a temporary clamp we stacked the rod string load off on the well head and we've created a gap more than three inches and we can then place this uh, uh, load cell up in this gap and you know you should never put your hand up here because a brake might slip but that's a quick and easy way to, to uh, uh, install a 30k load cell to measure the actual load. Now this is the 50k load cell and it's similar to the 30k load cell but it has on the bottom of it it has a jack 
and you pump hydraulic pressure through into this quick connect and you can see f four holes there there's four holes right there and these pistons come up and raise this load cell so if there's a gap and you can slide this spacer plate in there and, re and then release the hydraulic pressure and then the, the there's no requirement to stack the well off it's it's permanently stacked off with this this spool that's five inches tall so here I've got it spaced up there and I've just uh, pumped up the pressure and before we start the unit we've got to disconnect that uh, hose it's a very accurate and quick method to install of the load cell so here's here's what the well would normally look out look like without the 50k load cell mounted on the well so we've got uh, this is a inch and a quarter uh, polish rod we could have an inch and a half polish rod the spool goes around the polish rod you've got a washer on top and a washer on bottom of the spool and this gap is five inches tall and this load cell plus the plus the jack is 4.9 inches tall so there's a, a tenth of an inch space between the top of the load cell and the bottom of this uh, top washer when you stick it up there so here's a video of Ken uh, Skinner putting the 50k load cell on the well, and so here he's, he's walking up to the up the ladder, and he's placing that 50k load cell in that gap between the two washers. And we've got the cable already attached. You don't have to have the cable attached; you can attach it later. We use a locking nest on the cable so it doesn't it doesn't wiggle out. And here is the the pump. He's picked the pump, the quick connect hose up. The black hose. He goes up the ladder and he and he snaps that mm -hmm. uh, hose into the quick connect on the on the jack. And you know sometimes you have to wiggle a little bit to snap it on. Now he's got it snapped on. He'll go back down the ladder and he'll pick up the pump and the pump has a gauge on it. And so when you start to pump, initially the pressure increases as you pump, and then once it becomes constant, it's lifted. It's it's carrying the weighted rods and fluid on the hydraulic jack and that pressure remains constant as as you pump there starts to be a little gap up here between the load cell right there and the jack and so as he pumps this this, this space gets bigger and once it's a, a more than a quarter of an inch he goes down and picks this little spacer plate up that's got a scribe mark on it and here comes a little there's our spacer plate and he slides that space that spacer that's right in to the scribe mark and then now he has to release the hydraulic pressure and remove the hose and he's ready to and then we're ready to start acquiring data so it's it's a very quick and safe and easy technique to install a very accurate uh, load cell in the well and one of the biggest advantages of this load cell not only it's very accurate it doesn't have to have any changes on the, to the stuffing box to stack off on the wellhead and it doesn't have to worry about moving the pump any less than a tenth of an inch as I'll move the pump up so the pump stays in the same position so it's a really uh, quick and easy convenient uh, test load cell to set up and and you need to take off this hose before you start the pumping it up and this this cable is best if it has locking that's on it because while it's pumping you don't want this uh, this uh, slip-on cable to slip off, you want the locking nest to hold it on to the load cell. Uh, you can also use um, a pump-off controller uh, type load cell. So we, we, ca we call this a donut load cell in the United States, but it's a it's permanently mounted around the polish rod between the polish rod clamp and the carrier bar. And there's um, the, the, the way this works is you would have a certain type of load cell installed on your welds and you'd send us a cable that you would plug into your into your uh, pump off controller load cell and then we would attach a uh, to your cable the black cable we would attach a fitting and then if you use the PRT we build a, another a Y cable that go to the PRT and then go to the the, the main connector for the well analyzer and we read your load on your load cell and the acceleration of our PRT or if you used to purchase an accelerometer special then we would use your cable and connect it right into the accelerometer special and the, either the PRT or the 
PRT or the accelerometer specialist would be attached to the polish rod uh, below the carrier bar, and it would be used to get the acceleration of the polish rod, and your load cell would be used to measure the load. The one of the, uh, there's a few problems sometimes with this type of load cell because the workover crew can damage the load cell, or if there's a rod part, it can be damaged. Uh, we assume that the zero offset is zero, and sometimes it's not because it's been uh, used for a long time. Uh, if you don't load the load cell centrally, and you have a soft clamp, then the clamp can cut into one side or the other side of the lo load cell and cause a, the loading on the, the, the POC load cell to not be uniform. And then there, and some controllers have to be calibrated so the, the output of the controller is the same voltage that the uh, load cell is expecting. So you have to have some, in some case you have to calibrate the controller to output the right voltage for ex exciting the load cell. So those are some things that you have to worry about. Now this is the a slide that was published in uh, when we did a, this presentation on efficient monitoring rod pump wells with the wireless equipment. And it's showing the, the wireless gas gun attached to the casing annulus. And uh, we're, ta we're attaching the, the wireless PRT to the polish rod. And the base station that communicates with these two devices has two radios, so we can talk to multiple sensors at the same time. And so we've got this um, a PRT properly tightened. You can see that it's probably tightened. And you can download and read this article if you're interested in a little more detail. But here is a, a video of inside the auto, automobile next to the well. And we, we're acquiring data, dynamometer data, at the same time we say, hey, we need to shoot a fluid level. We saw something in the well or saw something on the dynamometer card that made us want to shoot a fluid level. And so we shot the fluid level at the exact same time we're acquiring the car, dynamometer card. And we can see what the distance of liquid is and see if there's anything unusual uh, on this fluid level shot that we might want to look at or compare. So you can also you can do both tests at the same time to save time, or you can also shoot a fluid level at, at a certain time. Let's say you see the well pump off, or let's say you see the well have start gas interference, and you can say, well, let's take a fluid level shot and see if we can see any difference in the well. And that's kind of... Uh, Different than TWM because you'd have to stop the test of a fluid level shot and then take a test with the TAM so the T T TWM software to shoot a fluid level and then possibly go back to recording the dynamometer and so that would that makes it a little more difficult to see what's going on with your well. So on our web page we have um, these how tos and there's also quick references on the web page and we also have some how to's step by step for how to acquire data uh, using the wireless equipment and so uh, this information is available and I th I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to let Dr. Podio take over so I'm going to click on stop sharing okay um, so far, we have, uh, or Lynn has talked about uh, the acquisition of the dynamometer data uh, with the objective of uh, studying the operation of the pump, the reloading of the uh, rods, and so forth. But uh, there is an additional measurement that we're interested in, and that is uh, related to the loading of the gearbox, uh, how much torque is being applied to the gearbox. And um, so we have to, uh, in order to do that calculation, we need to have an additional information about what the um, effect of the counterweights uh, is on the uh, polish rod. The weight of the counterweights is transmitted through the beam to the polish rod. And so that load, uh, which is known as the counterbalance effect, is then used in the calculation of the net torque of the, uh, of the well. Um, 
the way to perform this uh, test is to take advantage of the fact that if we stop the pumping unit uh, on the upstroke, uh, essentially as if we were doing a traveling valve test, we know that if uh, we leave the uh, beam uh, stationary, the load uh, at the polish rod is going to change as the fluid slips out of the uh, barrel uh, through the valves and uh, through the, the slippage. So um, taking advantage of that, uh, there is going to be a point in the measurement where the effect of the counterbalance load changes and at some point in the uh, process it balances the weight of the rods plus the weight of the fluid and we're going to be measuring the load at the surface and observe and determine when that balance uh, point occurs so <clears throat> the way to perform the test is then to operate the pumping unit uh, and on the upstroke, uh, one of the upstrokes, we stop the uh, motion and set the brake with the cranks horizontal. And then wait until the load of the polish rod equals the effect of the counterweights. How do we determine that? We determine that by monitoring whether the counterweights move either up or down when we release the brake. Um, once you do that measurement, uh, uh, we will have then a measurement of the, what we call the counterbalance effect, and we can plot that on the uh, surface dynamometer part. Now, the test is not performed very frequently. It's only performed when we first install the counterbalance of the counterweights or when we remove the counterweights. It requires a properly functioning brake, which is, you know, in some cases may be a problem. And then it also uh, requires that we use a load cell that is very um, very stable, there's not drift. And so generally the only uh, load cell that we can use for this test is either the horseshoe load cell or the hydraulic uh, horseshoe load cell. Those are the two load cells that we're gonna use. And then the other requirement is that the existing counterbalance must be between the traveling valve load and the standing valve load. If it is very out of balance and the uh, counterbalance effect is either excessively high or excessively low, then we will not find the equilibrium point. So the starting point is to run the, the Polish rod, uh, the unit uh, as normal and uh, selecting the CVE test and observing then the load of the surface. Um, why are we want to do this, this test? Because it is one of the most critical values in the torque calculations. And there are other sources of error for, in the torque calculations. The most common ones are listed here. We have wrong pumping unit is selected. The pumping unit may not be in the database. The pumping unit that we have described in the database does not uh, you know, match the pumping unit that we have in the field. We're using the wrong stroke length. We have indicated that the directional rotation is uh, counter, <coughs> counter the clock or with the clock, and it is not correct. And then number six is we have the wrong CBE or CBN value. So, one of the things we need to make sure is that we need to always verify the well data 
and that includes all the mechanical lift system, the rod string, uh, and, and so forth. We also need to uh, indicate the, whether we're going to use the uh, counterbalance effect uh, in the calculations, or if we have not performed the test, one alternative is to use a calculated counterbalance moment from the counterweight database. <clears throat> Before we start the test, it is important uh, to synchronize whatever timing device we have, a stopwatch or a cell phone, <clears throat> with uh, the uh, uh, clock of the laptop that we're going to be using. Because in the test, we're going to measure the time from the start of the test to the time when equilibrium was achieved. It's very, very useful before we run the test to also run a traveling valve, standing valve test with an extended uh, traveling valve part of the test. So normally, when we do the standing valve and traveling valve, we stop the unit only for about maybe uh, 10, 15 seconds. In this case, what we want to do is we want to run the uh, traveling valve test, stop the pump on the upstroke, and wait until the load declines all the way back down to the weight of the rods and fluid. And you see, in this region, where it is indicated, that is where at some point in here, the weight of the uh, rods plus the fluid are going to balance the load that is uh, the pull that is provided by the counterweights. And that will be then the uh, equilibrium point. So having done this test uh, ahead of time, we have an idea of how long it takes for from the moment we stop until we see this uh, uh, decrease in the uh, load. So uh, here we're seeing a test that has been performed. Again, you know, we ran the pumping unit, stopped on the upstroke with the cranks uh, horizontal at uh, 90 degrees. We set the brake. And then after a few seconds, we release the brake and we monitor whether the cranks are moving. If they're moving, we set the brake again and wait a little longer and repeat the operation. The cranks move, we wait, the cranks move, we wait and the cranks move. And then eventually there is going to be a point where the polish rod load has decreased and it matches the counterbalance effect load. So when we release the brake here, the cranks do not move. So we want to indicate to the program how long it took between the start of the test until the point that the equilibrium was achieved. In this case, it took 79.5 seconds from the start of the test. <clears throat> uh, the procedure then it is, you click the CBE button, then click start new test and we note the time or, or we start our uh, timer at that particular point. We stop the unit on the upstrokes with the crank level. Determine whether the polish rod load is greater or less you know, by releasing the brake to check for movement and then record the time where the cranks are uh, balanced, the load. So this is the on the TAM program, this is the, the button that you uh, start the test. When you click start a test, you also start the uh, timer. And uh, here is the uh, example of a test in progress. Now, one of the features of the TAM program is that simultaneously with the load at the polish rod, which is the black line over here, we can also display the acceleration and the acceleration, when we stop the unit, the acceleration 
levels off, it's, it's stationary, but whenever the cranks move, we can see an acceleration signal. So this is a, a, a double check that, you know, the uh, cranks were moving at this particular point. So uh, we want to find the time when by, after releasing the brake, we see that there is no movement of the cranks. And so here, continue the test. Again, the cranks moved here, the cranks moved here, the cranks moved here. So we have not reached the equilibrium point. And the time has been almost a minute in this particular weld. In some welds, it may be a lot quicker. It depends a lot on whether you have uh, leakage through the valves or a lot of slippage. In some cases, the slippage may be so large that almost immediately you go past the equilibrium point, and so the test is not feasible. So here is uh, uh, the completed test. This, if you notice here again, the acceleration signal is stationary when we release the brake here. And so this point is the point you need to identify. And again, one way to identify that is to note the time when the, when the cranks were stationary. But there are other methods to indicate that, depending on what instrument are you using. If you're using the wired well analyzer, then the timing, the measurement of the timing is the only method that you can use. If you're using a wireless, uh, or shoe without uh, a, an extra, uh, some uh, echometer customers uh, are having, are, have available both a horseshoe load cell and a PRT, a wire, wired PR, wireless PRT. And so in this case, you have a third option, which is if you have a wireless horseshoe and a <coughs> wireless PRT, you can use the wireless PRT to send the signal, to transmit a signal to the TAM program that you have reached the balance point. So <clears throat> in, if you have a wired well analyzer, then once you get to the equilibrium point, you have to uh, indicate the, I mean, you have to record the time when that is. Then when you analyze the data, you move the marker to the point of equilibrium, and then it will read, it will give you the counterbalance effect load. So uh, this is the method for the wired well analyzing. If you have a wireless uh, HD recording only, also you have to take care and get the exact clock time when the cranks did not move, and then Again, you move the marker to that position and uh, record the uh, CBE load. And then the other method, if you have both a wireless horseshoe and you're using that to measure the load, you can, and you have also a wireless PRT, you can turn on the wireless PRT. Uh, get it online, and then when you get and then observe the variation of the load, and then when you see the equilibrium point, then you can uh, click on the acquire button of the wireless VRT and automatically it transmits that to the time program. The time program uh, puts the uh, CBE marker line at the right point. So these are the uh, methods to achieve the CBE. And of course, the CBE, again, is used for torque analysis. Uh, as I said earlier, you don't perform this test unless you have just installed the unit, installed the counterweights, or you have moved the counterweights from a previous position. So it's, it's not a test that is run very frequently. Uh, once you have that information in the TAM program, that information goes into a database and uh, it is recorded. And you see here 
this was performed several times, different times on this particular well. And the program uses, when we click on this button, it uses the last value uh, for the calculations of the, of the torque. And you notice here that these measurements were pretty uniform for these two dates. Um, and then uh, this was done uh, differently. So one of the things you might be useful is to repeat the test um, when, uh, if you have any doubts about the, uh, the accuracy of the, of the measurement, or if you have difficulties in establishing the equilibrium point. So that's uh, uh, all my part of the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over back to uh, Carrie Ann as to continue the um, session. Yes, I think we have a, a few questions before Carrie Ann starts showing her part. Okay, go ahead. Yes, a question from the previous portion of the presentation is. Uh, is if the orientation of the PRT, either installing it parallel or perpendicular to the carrier bar, has any effect or matters to the accuracy of the data? Well, uh, remember the PRT measures, has to measure the diameter change of the polished rod, right? And so it has to, see if I can find it. Yeah. Okay, it has to measure the diameter, so it has to be perpendicular to the orientation of the polished rod, and it has to be aligned properly so that the points of measurement are across the diameter. Yes, but not necessarily need to be uh, in alignment to the carrier bar. It shouldn't be a problem unless we have a bent polished rod. Well, in the alignment with the carrier bar, I mean, it has to be parallel. You know, the, the body of the PRT has to be parallel to the carrier bar. But the PRT itself not only has to be in this orientation, it has to be <clears throat> located so that it's measuring across the diameter of the polished rod. Right. And another question is if, uh, in order to calculate the buoyancy rod weight, then a most accurate value of the oil density is needed? Uh, not only yes, so the answer to that is yes. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, one of the uncertainties here is that in the tubing where the uh, rods are located, uh, there is a mixture of oil, uh, gas, and water. And so <clears throat> you have to have the correct densities of the, of the uh, at least of the oil and the water. But uh, one of the question is, uh, what is the percentage of gas that you have in the, in the tubing? And so uh, WRF is going to be affected by that particular uh, number. Uh, I think, and I'm not 100% uh, sure, that in the uh, calculation, uh, the TAM assumes that there is no gas in the uh, tubing, only a mixture of oil and water with the two densities. Mm -hmm. But then uh, you have the option of changing that in the detailed analysis. And I think that's some topic that we might want to talk about uh, on a different session. The tubing fluid gradient, yes. Okay, uh, another question. Well, we have a couple of questions from Pierre asking uh, if the PRT has a load limit. The, the answer is no, there is no uh, limit for the loads that you can measure with the PRT. Oh, the limit. Um, well, remember that the PRT measured the change in diameter. It doesn't measure the load. Uh, so um, basically uh, there is no load limit. Uh, the, the limit is uh, what the uh, polish rod can, can support. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, <clears throat> when uh, you are measuring, you're measuring a very, very small 
uh, change in, in diameter. And so if the well is uh, deep and the change in load is significant, you normally get a much more accurate uh, measurement that when the well is shallow and you have very small change in load, uh, because we're measuring, again, thousands, of, tens of thousands of an inch of change. Uh, so the reason I, I mentioned this is that in shallow wells, you have to be extra careful making sure that you have installed the PRT correctly and uh, that there are no other loads, especially in the case of the wired PRT, you want to make sure that the cable does not pull on the PRT and generate an extra load, which is not related to what's happening on the polished rock. And so in the recommendations, to make sure that the uh, pull of the cable is not transmitted. And you can do that several ways. One is to uh, loop the cable on the other side of the, of the handle. You can tie the cable to the polished rod using uh, a, a bar, bar cable or something. Uh, and that is very important on a shallow well. Another question is, what causes my pump car and surface car do not mirror each other? So yeah, hello. So yes. Um, yes. if we go back in the slides in, in the presentation, there were one slide where we were seeing a gas in different scale and on top, I was seeing something totally different on my surface scale. So what causes this kind of behavior? that my pump card and my surface card doesn't have similar features. Sure, so the, the surface card that, that you see is taken from measurements being taken at the surface by the dynamometer sensor. And so within the sensor, we're acquiring acceleration, and then we're also acquiring load, or with the PRT, we're, we're getting an indirect calculation of the load. And then within the, the program, there's something called the wave equation. The wave equation takes into account for how the load propagates through the rod string up to the surface. And so we take the measurements that were taken at the surface and apply this wave equation. And that gives us an idea of what's happening down hole, what's happening at the pump to give us the surface card shape that you see. So we use the surface card data to calculate the pump card load. And so that, that's why they're different. That's why they're, the images are different because the loads you know, propagate through the rod string, depending on the, the type of rod string that you have, depending on the load, depending on the movement. And so th that's why the surface card and pump card are not the same. Does, does that answer your question, Sam? Yes, and uh, to add a little bit more to that, Kiran is that uh, they, they were not supposed to look exactly the same as we're we're looking at, like in this example, surface loads over 20,000 pounds. And we're going to have a different polished rod movement compared to the plunger movement, which is what represents the bottom hole car. And there is a, let's say, rod elongation or and shrinkage. So there is a, a rod elongation that is affecting the travel uh, on the pump car compared to the surface car. So they're all different factors that are affecting the bottom hole car shape that usually is not supposed to be, unless you have a very slow or shallow well where loads are not fluctuating so much, that they will be more similar under those conditions. Okay, thanks. One more question from Daryl before we continue is, uh, he asked, does an anchor tubing have any effect on the CBE test? No, it should not uh, have any significant effect because uh, we are stopping on the upstroke and, and uh, uh, we're not uh, relying on uh, any motion of the plunger. It's just uh, measuring the change in load and that's irrespective of uh, whether the tubing is anchored or not anchored. Mm. Okay, so I'll stop uh, sharing my screen. Um, and turn it I, over I, to Carrie Ann. 
Can I make a Thank comment? You. Yes, please. Um, Manuel Bracho here from Mexico. Uh, one one thing that we have seen in some of the wells here in Mexico is that the, even though it's anchor, there's somehow a failure in between the uh, attachment or, or the contact area of the anchor or the or the slips of the anchor to the casing, and the whole tube intends to move up and down depending on on how tight is the piston inside the pump. So that will show that will create a situation that is is completely uh, abnormal, and the readings will be different. Just just sharing what we have we have seen here. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Hmm. I have another comment from Hector, and he says he always tests uh, hermeticity on the valve before the contrabalance effect test. If there is a leak, uh, he doesn't take the contrabalance effect test or he doesn't measure it. And if he's asking if that's a good practice, so he's asking, he's checking valve. If the valves are leaking, then he won't attempt to do a CBE test. If valves are okay, then he will do it. Then he's asking if that's a good practice or not. Well, it, well, it depends on uh, how serious the leak is. Uh, I mean, we're relying on the load changing, which means that the traveling valve is uh, you know, uh, going to be, the traveling valve test is going to show a decrease. So if the decrease in load, if the leak is very significant and, you know, the load drops in a matter of uh, five or ten seconds, uh, it's very difficult to run the test. Um, so, you know, but if the leak is uh, not very, very significant, very fast, I think I would go ahead and try to run the test. And that is right. That's what we see in the practice. When we have a bad traveling valve leakage, you can't catch the point where the equilibrium is achieved. But if you have a minor leakage, then you have enough time to catch the point that you can attempt to do the test. That's right. Okay, carrie Ann, I think you can move forward. Okay, so the the next section here, um, we have a dynamometer workbook that we present during our um, during our schools. And so we wanted to follow up this workshop with this uh, dynamometer workbook. And so I've got 10 examples here, and it just sort of presents a, a pump card or a situation. And ask the question about what would we see when we when we see a card that looks like this, or what what should be considered when we look at our dynamometer data. So I have the workbook here, and then I have, um, as I mentioned before, on our website the TAM dynamometer data that goes with it. So let's go ahead and get started here. And if you do have questions, please continue to um, ask them in the chat. Okay. So our first question here, when you see a pump card like this, where would you expect the liquid level to be? So one thing that we always teach is that your fluid level should always complement your dynamometer data. If you're going to take the time to set up and acquire dynamometer data, make sure you take that extra couple of minutes to acquire two fluid level shots. And we always want you to take, take two shots. And if those shots, um, if you're able to re repeat the results on those shots, then that's good. If you take two shots and they're not the same, then take a third shot. You know, you want to make sure that you're able to pinpoint where that fluid level is and understand your fluid level shot, too, because that's going to be that one extra piece of the puzzle with your dynamometer data. Um, there's been lots of times when we've received dynamometer data from an operator, or but there wasn't any fluid level shots, or maybe there was just one shot that was questionable. So um, that fluid level shot is going to help you get that full picture when you're trying to put together what's going on with your well. So you should always make sure that the dynamometer data and the fluid level data complement each other. So last week we talked about reference load lines. And when we look at the pump card's position relative to those reference lines, we can get a lot of information even just at a glance. So if you look at this card here, um, 
I have some annotations turned on. So we have the FO max line. And so the FO max line is the line that is placed by the software. This would be a reference line if the pump intake pressure was zero. Then you see an FO from fluid level line. So the FO from fluid level line looks at the last fluid level shot and reads the pump intake pressure from that fluid level shot and then it places that FO from fluid level line where the top of that pump card should be according to the pump intake pressure from the fluid level shot. Okay, so we're, we'll, we'll look at some examples comparing the two here. And then of course we have our zero load line. And we can see here the bottom of this card goes a little bit below that zero load line. So remember when you're using the polish rod transducer, because we're getting measuring indirect load, we're just measuring that change in cross-sectional area and then using the um, properties of the rod string to calculate the load, we have to go ahead and set the um, bottom of the pump card on the zero load line. If you're using a horseshoe load cell, you, know, you, you perform a zero offset before you begin acquiring. And so if you see the bottom of the card go below that zero load line, then that is an indication of unaccounted friction. And so we've, we've had that discussed in, I believe it was session two, we talked about some unaccounted friction. So just the placement of the card within those reference load lines and also considering which dynamometer sensor you were using when you were acquiring the data is going to help give you an idea just at a glance what you're looking at. So with this particular card here, the question we're being asked is where would you expect the liquid level to be? So to answer this, we want to look at the top of the pump card right, relative to that FO max line. So again, the FO max line assumes the pump intake pressure is zero. So if the top of the pump card reaches the top of the um, or the, pump, the top of the pump card reaches the FO max line, then we would expect to have low pump intake pressure and our fluid level would be at the pump. We have a low fluid level. The farther away the top of the card is from that FO max line tells us the pump intake pressure is going to be higher. And when we shoot a fluid level, we're going to expect us to see a high fluid level over the pump. All right, so here we see the top of the card is at the FO max line. Um, so we would expect that we're going to have a low pump intake pressure. And so when we look at the low pump at the pump intake pressure from the dynamometer card, we see here that it's 76 PS, PSI. So when we shoot a fluid level, here we shoot our fluid level and we see that the fluid level is uh, 24 feet. We have a gaseous liquid column of 24 feet over the pump and our equivalent gas free fluid height of 16 feet over the pump. All right. So here are the that the fluid level shot complements our dynamometer card. So we have uh, the top of the card is at the maximum load line. So we expect that we're going to have low pump intake pressure and a low fluid level. All right, so we shoot our fluid level, it's just above the pump. We have low pump intake pressure calculated on our fluid level as well. So the answer to number one, our fluid level would be expected to be just above the pump and it is. All right, so question number two, is this well pumped off? So looking at the pump card shape, you know, if we're looking at our pump card shape down here, there's several things we can see. First of all, we see that we have partial pump fillage. We're not seeing compression here. If we look on the downstroke, we're not seeing gas compression. We're seeing more of this falling down We see where we see the pump falling. And then you can even see a little bit of an impact load where um, the pump hits the fluid, all right? So it appears that we're looking at a fluid pound here. The top of the card reaches the FO max line, which indicates low pump intake pressure. And we see the low pump intake pressure right up here. Our pump intake pressure is three PSI that was uh, calculated from our dynamometer data. So we would expect to see with the top of the card at the FO max line and low pump intake pressure, we would expect to see a fluid level at the pump to complement our pumped off card here. But if you look over here, um, here we see this is where we have that um, animation of the, the pump movement. And so if you look right over here, this pump intake pressure from the fluid level 
says that the pump intake pressure was calculated to be 877 PSI. And the pump intake pressure calculated from the dynamometer card was three PSI. And so if you look at the placement of this FO from fluid level line right here, this tells us that this is where, according to the calculated pump intake pressure from the fluid level, this is where the top of the card should be, All right? So this is letting us know right here that there's a discrepancy. There's a discrepancy between the fluid level and our dynamometer card. All right, so let me just pull this up here for us. All right, so here we see the dynamometer card. The top of the card is at the FO max line. Right-hand side here, we see the pump intake pressure is 3 PSI. But when we look over here at the pump intake pressure from the fluid level, we see it's 877 PSI. All right. So to show you where this comes from, I'm going to go back here and click on my annotations. Since you guys didn't get to see that before. So in the annotations, here's the check mark for keeping these surface and pump cards on one plot. Uh, the FO max line that we're comparing the top of our cards to, that is the FO max line, we want that on. The FO calculated from the pump intake pressure from the fluid level, that's the line here. And then the valve open close points, and of course our zero load line. So over here on the animation, I always turn on my the pump intake pressure, the pump discharge pressure, and the pump intake pressure from the fluid level. And also, oh, in the, the current chamber pressure. And so it's, it's really educational for me. Um, you know, we're starting at the bottom of the stroke, the rods start pulling up. And so we get a pressure drop inside the pump chamber, if you're watching this number right over here. And so that's holding all the way to the top of the stroke. All right, so now we're at the top of the stroke, and now we have a certain pump discharge pressure that we have to overcome. And so you, if you'll see the pump intake pressure or the, the pressure in the chamber is very low. All right, so it shows that a minus 15. So we have to compress everything that's in the pump. So we see it compressing on the downstrokes and we see the number increasing very slowly because there's not much in there to compress. All right, and so now we're about to hit that point of impact, okay, and so now we see that pressure jump up to 2,000, and now we're compressing that fluid as well to overcome the discharge pressure until our traveling valve opens and then our fluid goes, goes to the surface. So these are really, you know, just, just to get an idea when you're looking at your card and actually what's happening, you know, we have the animation where you can replay those stroke after stroke, but it's also kind of nice just to be able to go through it step by step and Watch things as they're occurring when you're looking at that animation. Okay, so I got I got off track a little bit, but um, all right. So we're looking at a blocked intake card, but we want to go back and look at our fluid level here. So I'm going to click on liquid level. All right. So when we look at this fluid level shot, we see a high fluid level. All right. And so from looking at our dynamometer card, we would have expected to have the fluid level just above the pump, but we're not. We're seeing we're seeing something different. We're, we're uh, seeing a contradiction to what we would expect. So the first thing you want to do, you want to always go back and take a look at your data first and make sure that everything is analyzed correctly. All right. So let's say we went and took a look at the wellbore schematic here, and I'm going to come over here to my well description and. It just so happens that there's a liner in this well, and the top of the liner hits at 4,045 feet. Well, I don't see that here. That wasn't that wasn't indicated in that wellbore overlay. So if I come over here to my mechanical wellbore, so if we want to enter a liner, so the liner top is at 4,050 feet. We put our bottom at 6760. So I'm going to turn this into 4,050, and let's say it was a, I don't know, seven inch liner. Okay, let's save that. All right, so now where we see that nice big kick, what if that was actually the top of the liner? 
and our liquid level is actually right down here. Okay, so if you have a well that has a liner in it, there's so much energy coming off the gun that lots of times when it hits the liner, it takes a lot of that energy. You see a nice big kick and there's not a whole lot of energy left when it gets down to where your fluid level is at. So this is another good reason to take multiple fluid level shots, but you have to have an accurate wellbore schematic. You've got to make sure that you have accurate wellbore information. All right, so if we go back and look now at our dynamometer, with the corrected fluid level shot, now we see our pump intake pressure from the fluid level is 31 PSI. The top of the card now sits correctly. You know, we see the FO from fluid level, also at the FO max line. And so now this turns into what? A pumped off card. Okay, so we've gone from having a blocked intake with the high fluid level. We've gone back, we've corrected our liquid level shot. We entered our liner, and so now we have an accurate assessment of what's going on with this well, all right, which was actually the well was pumped off. All right, so let's go back and look at my PowerPoint. With our first run through, we saw blocked intake. We went back and reviewed the fluid level. So our liquid level that the software picked was actually the liner. The liquid level was actually down further just above the pump. And so now we have an accurate analysis. The well is pumped off and we're pounding fluid. All right, so the, the major lesson here is when you see a discrepancy, go back and take a look at your data first and make sure that everything is analyzed correctly. Make sure you have an accurate well for somatic and you're able to determine what you're seeing down hole um, is accurate and that way you're not um, turning in incorrect information, like you have a blocked intake, when actually it was just a liquid level that wasn't analyzed correctly. All right, number three, I better keep moving here. So number three, where would you expect the liquid level to be? So right away we see the pump card is showing partial pump fillage, and there's definite compression on the downstroke rather than that drop that we see that we saw in our last card with the pumped off card or with the restricted intake. So we know there's gas interference. So let's find our FO max line. The top of the card is well below the FO max line, which tells us we are going to have a high pump intake pressure. And we see that up here. We see our pump intake pressure, 732 PSI. So when we shoot our fluid level, we know that if we know we have a high pump intake pressure, we know the height of the fluid has a direct impact on our pump intake pressure, then we're going to expect to see a high fluid level. And considering the gas compression visible on the downstroke, we expect to see a lot of gas coming up through the liquid. All right, so we shoot our fluid level. We have a high fluid level, high pump intake pressure calculation on the fluid level. And so we would expect to see a high gaseous liquid column. All right, so all that checks out. All right, number four. Do we have a leaky valve, pump slippage, or unanchored tubing, and how can we verify it? So first, why is the question being asked? Why is there an assumption that there's something wrong with this card? Well, we're not seeing the nice squared corners and rectangle shape we would like to see from a full pump card. Uh, we also see that of the 100 inches of maximum plunger travel, this dotted line is telling us we are effectively using only a portion of that and that we're losing some load here. So there are different reasons as to why we may not be picking up a full load right away. So three of those reasons we see here are possibly a leaky traveling valve, pump slippage due to slippage past the pump, due to the pump clearances, and unanchored tubing. And I'm sure you guys are already yelling unanchored tubing at your computer screens right now, but let's just pretend like we don't know. So how can we verify these three main issues? Well, to check for unanchored tubing, you can check the well file or check for tension. Um, the fact that this is a full pump allows us to see the unanchored tubing effects on both the upstroke and the downstroke, which is an advantage for identifying unanchored tubing. 
Uh, to check for a leaky valve, you can perform a valve test using either your PRT or your load cell. See, um, and then to check for pump slippage, one of the things you can do is check the current production and see whether the production numbers correlate with the pump displacement. You can also check your pump, your pump clearances, um, and if they're significant, then a certain amount of load loss would be expected. So just as a side note, if you're interested in more in-depth information on pump slippage, our section six on uh, June 24th was titled, How Much Liquid Does My Sucker Rod Pump Actually Pump? And it has some great information on using the TAM calculation features to help you account for every barrel of fluid produced. Okay, so with this, um, we have our pump card here. If we were to perform a valve test, we would see that here's our traveling valve test here, and we see that it's holding nicely with the traveling valve check. Um, let the pump go a few, take a few strokes, and you're going to uh, stop the pump near the top of the stroke and hold it here. We hold it for normally about 10, 10 seconds, and we see that it's holding. If we had a traveling valve leak, we would see that load leak off right away. All right, this well has unanchored tubing, no valve leakage is shown from the traveling valve analysis. The pump displacement is verified with current production rates. All right, now let's look at this example. Leaky valve pump slippage or unanchored tubing. Our methods of verifying are of course gonna be the same, so I'll just put those in here. Um, let's go ahead and open this one in TAM. All right, so if I go to pick well, then we're on number five, slippage. Let's pull up a test here. Okay. Here we see our pump card. And one of the things that you probably see is the spot here. Um, when you're looking at your data, if you wanted to be able to look at all of your cards at once, there's an events button here. If you click that events button, now we can see all of the cards. And if I want to look at these cards overlaid, I need to go to my field view. Okay, so now I can see all these cards overlaid. So um, if you have something like this, I would suspect this is a, an issue with the pump. It's a plunger velocity and sticking issue downhole. It's a downhole sticking issue. Yeah. All right. So this is one way, though, that you can overlay all those cards to see, is it something that's happening every stroke, or is it something that's significant to one particular stroke? All right. If we wanted to check for pump clearances, so let me take us to first our well file. So I'm going to open my well file and go to the lift system and come over here to rod string and pump. So when you're entering your rod string and pump information, if you go to that last tab, rod, rod string and pump, down here in the pump information here, you have the opportunity to enter your pump clearance. And so um, if it's three thousand, six thousand, nine thousand. you can enter that information here. All right, so this, this is where you can enter that pump clearance information. And then we can open our annotations here. No, pump card analysis. And pull that over for you guys. Okay, so under the pump card analysis, this last tab says pump displacement. And so there's something here called the slippage equation. And so uh, the software looks at the pump clearance that you entered, and then it can calculate a certain amount of slippage using the Patterson slippage equation. So here we see that there is a, um, a loss of 8.8, .8, no, 23 barrels per day due to slippage. All right, so another sort of rule of thumb that we have here, you see this unanchored tubing line and so under your annotations, there's a box here next to unanchored tubing stretch on pump card. Okay, so when you turn that on, what, if the card lays 
further than the unanchored tubing stretch line, then that would be an indication that you possibly have a leaky valve. You've got a leaky traveling valve. If the, um, if the slope of the card is to the left of the unanchored tubing stretch line, then that would be an indication of pump slippage. And then if it's parallel to, you know, it has the same slope as the unanchored tubing line, that's the indication that, that would be a verification that it's unanchored tubing. All right, so with this particular example, this was pump slippage. Carry on to the right is unanchored tubing and slippage, right? So if you go back to that slide, this slide, yeah, slide right here, if right. you're to the right of the anchor tubing line, that means you're unanchored plus slippage. If you're to the left, it means you're anchored and you only have slippage. Thank you. Okay. All right. Number six, why is production not getting to the tank? So looking at the information we have, we say our pump displacement is 94 barrels per day, but no production is getting to the tank. There's nothing coming to surface. When we look at our pump card, we see that it's full of fluid, but only a small fluid load is being applied to the rods. The fluid load the pump is applying to the rods should be near the maximum fluid load line, right? So if we're, we, if we're getting a full pump, the top of the card should be at the maximum load line. Our pump displacement is calculated as 94 barrels per day, but no production is getting to the tank. All right, so let's look at TAM here. All right, so when we shoot a fluid level on this well, all right, here we see the, the pump card. Let's go to our liquid level. All right, so this operator shot a fluid level and he saw a little down kick here. All right, so increase the pressure there and we see a little bit bigger down kick. And then there's a little bit of time here, 148 to 238. I think that's when they called Lynn. And so uh, this operator looked at their well bore schematic and there was nothing at this particular point here. If we turn on our depth reference line, that depth reference line can give us a depth. And so at 4,060 feet, when that pressure wave is traveling down the well bore, it's when it's traveling down the annulus, it's hitting on something physical there. Looking at the wellbore schematic, he saw nothing that should indicate there should be anything taking up space. All right, so we know something's taking up space because we see a downward kick here. So when something doesn't make sense, when you take multiple fluid levels and you're not seeing any changes, one thing that we suggest you do is to change the conditions in the well. And so what we recommended was that he shut down the pumping unit. So he shut down the unit, waited a little bit, and then shot the fluid level again. And so now he's seeing an up kick here. So what this was, when the pump was running, the fluid was being pumped up and then coming right out of that hole in the tubing, right? So he's pumping everything up just to the hole in the tubing and then it was falling back out, all right? So one of the things you could do here, let's overlay these shots. <clears throat> so if I turn on previous shots, Okay, and then I come over here and turn on the one of the shots that showed the down kick. So we can see the up kick and the down kick. One other thing to look at, if you're overlaying shots and you're trying to line things up, you have a choice here of overlaying by depth or overlaying by time. And sometimes, you know, if if the collar count was different on these two shots and the collar count was used to calculate the acoustic velocity, the, the depths might be just a little bit different. But if you overlay by time, once you fire that shot and there's something physical in the well, it's going to hit at the same time every time. So sometimes overlaying by time will line things up a little bit better so that um, maybe it makes more sense. But anyway, so that's, that's kind of one thing to keep in line. We have a couple of questions and we will address them later. All right, I'll get through these here. Okay, 
So hole in the tubing. Number seven, why is my fluid load not reaching the maximum load line? So here we have another scenario where we're seeing what looks to be a full pump, but the top of the car is not reaching the maximum load line. All right. So let's look at the pump displacement to production. So the pump displacement calculated is 881 barrels per day, and we are getting production to surface 837 barrels per day. So when we shoot our fluid level, we see that the fluid level is um, up near the surface. We have a really high gaseous liquid column. So the fluid is flowing up the casing or we're pumping up the tubing. The pump is doing little work as evidenced by the fluid load. The pump intake pressure from the high fluid level helps lift the fluid to the surface. The high pump intake pressure reduces the fluid load required by the rods to lift the fluid to the surface. So this is called flumping. Have you guys heard of flumping? Flowing while pumping. And there was a technical paper that was written, a presentation done um, by Lynn Rowland. That's uh, available to view, and I'll make sure and put that out there for you guys that are interested. I will add that to our um, PDF bundle. Any comments on that one? This is a, a good example. All right. So this is just looking at making some observations. So a couple of things we see right away, partial pump village. We see some unanchored tubing or some delay in picking up the fluid load. The top of the card is at the FO max line indicating low pump intake pressure. And so when we shoot our fluid level, we'd expect to see a fluid level just above, just right there at the pump. Um, all right, so let's open up TAM here. All right, so this, this file contains two, um, two analysis, two sets of data approximately two weeks apart. So the first analysis has a full pump with very little fluid over the pump. Two weeks later, the pump capacity is exceeding the well's inflow. So it's a good example of unanchored tubing with the fluid level at the pump. All right, and so here we can see, you guys can see both the full pump conditions and then fluid pound conditions are shown here. One of the things that um, you might want to look for, so I have I had turned on the valve open close points. And if you'll look here, this shows the pump displacement is minus one barrels per day. And so if you look over here, the traveling valve open point was not put in the right spot by the software. All right, so if I bring it back over here, now we have an accurate uh, pump displacement, something that makes more sense. All right, so um, if something doesn't make sense, make sure that the software did a good job of analyzing the data. And occasionally we do see this where you, you may need to go in and move that traveling valve open point to the correct spot so that your data is correct. All right, so if something doesn't make sense, look at the data and make sure, look at the analysis first and make sure that everything was analyzed correctly. Here's a standing valve, uh, leaky standing valve here. And so one thing you can do is perform a valve check to verify your standing valve leakage. So this is an example of a valve test where the valves are holding. Here's two traveling valve and then two standing valve. And so for this particular card here, this was the standing valve test. This was that valve test for the card. So here's the traveling valve test, and then we have two standing valve. And you see immediately when the pump was stopped that the standing valve leaked, and so we started taking on load. All right, so the valve check shows the rods picking up fluid load during the standing valve check. All right, and the last one here, why is the pump card showing negative loads? So um, one thing to point out here is uh, if your pump card looks look like it's swollen out above and below your FO max line and below your zero load line, then that's an indication of unaccounted friction. If you look at your surface card, it can give you some clues as to friction. So here we see, if you see a, a vertical line on your surface card, 
That's an indication of friction, all right? So here we have some friction here. And you have some options to go into the software. So let me come over here to unaccounted well bore friction. And while I'm pulling this up, our um, session two was called examples of forces not accounted for by the wave equation. And so it, it covered all kinds of examples of unaccounted friction and different ways that you can account for them. So if you go into the pump card analysis and this damping right here, so you have some damping factors that you can change. You wanna be careful though, not to over manipulate your card with, with these um, damping factors, right? So I can reset those here. But say you have some stepping box friction, you know, you can just put in 500 pounds here and you can see that it will kind of help adjust, you know, take some of that bloat out of the card, um, get you a little bit uh, more level top of the card that you can work with. So just be careful that you don't over manipulate the card and then you're taking away from what, what the actual data is trying to tell you. Okay, so that is the end of my workbook. So do we have some questions, Gustavo? Yes, we do have a, a few questions and I'm gonna start with a part of the question from the previous presentation and it is related to the PRT. And the question is, are valve tests with the PRT just as accurate as they are with the low tail, or is the accuracy gap even less due to the static condition? And that's a fair question. Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and try to answer that real quick. Um, it's important when you when you use the PRT that the uh, polish rod is not being bent by misalignment, and that can that can tend to cause. Um, um, diameter changes that aren't representative to the fluid load pulling on the rod string and changing diameter only to the fluid load. The other thing is that the PRT is sensitive to temperature change. So usually when Ken and I would go to a well, uh, he would put the polish rod transducer on the well first thing and try to get it to acclimate to the temperature of the polish rod and that would tend to make the data from the polish rod transducer uh, not drift as much. And so uh, if you see the minimum loads and the peak loads not being at about the same level as the PRT, then that's going to have a, a, a change in the ch effect of the change in load. And it may look like the PRT is leaking when all it is is the temperature changing. So, so um, if you put the PRT on early, uh, quickly in the beginning, and temperature stabilized, then the PRT can can uh, look and appear just as good as a uh, uh, PRT uh, loads valve test data taken with a horseshoe load cell. Okay. Okay. Uh, a quick question is uh, related to the Patterson equation asking: Is the pump slippage equation based upon 100% runtime during a 24-hour period? The the pump well that's 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 a good question. The the pump slippage equation we developed it at Texas Tech at the Texas Tech test well with water, and the pump cards were full pump cards filled with water. So so uh, yes, it's, it assumes that the the slippage is based on the pump that's full. Um, and then the runtime you can use the runtime to adjust the amount of slippage. So the runtime means what percent of the day but the slippage calculations is, is a percentage of the card how much of the uh, the full card will you lose to slippage and that's what it's that's what it's based on you know it's it's, it's um you know you, you you may have more slippage if you um well let's just let's just say yes it's based on the full card so that's that's the answer to the question yes and the other question related to that is uh, is the oil viscosity taken into consideration when determining the amount of slippage? Yes, the in TAM, the, the oil viscosity is 
defaults of 0.76, which is a viscosity of the water that was that was uh, at the temperature of the Texas Tech test well. And so in TAM, you have an input to change that 0.76 to another value. And so when we talk about pump slippage in the previous uh, pump slippage presentation, we also provided a Excel spreadsheet where you input the water gravity, oil gravity, um, reservoir temperature, the bubble point pressure, and then the viscosity that you want to use is viscosity at the average pressure across the pump uh, with the bubble point pressure being the intake pressure. So it's going to include the effects of how much gas is in solution based on your pump intake pressure and then that's going to uh, then give you an average viscosity um, for oil and water based on the oil and water percentage um, if you're above uh, about 30 API gravity. If you're below 30 API gravity then the viscosity uh, probably should, should, should just be the oil uh, in the well uh, adjusted for reservoir temperature and bubble point pressure. But that spreadsheet takes care of that. If you have a question about that you're you're free to email us a, a question. Email me, Lynn at Equimy.com or someone else. Okay, the next question is related to the TAM sulfur input. In the lip system, we have the plunger clearance box. And the question is, uh, most barrels are minus two. If plunger clearance is minus three, then the true pump clearance would be minus five. So is TAM requesting only the plunger clearance or pump clearance? It's a total. It's the it's the OD of the OD of the plun the OD of the plunger subtracted away from the Minus. ID of the of the barrel. So it's the total clearances. So so it's it's not just uh, the minus clearance on the plunger, but you have to add the plus clearance on the on the barrel. Yes, yeah, so for for his practical example it would be a minus five the input that you need to yeah, well so five thousand point yeah point oh oh three inches or five thousandths of an inch for the right, input so in the software. Point oh oh three plus point oh two be point oh oh five. That's what you type in into the clearance. Mm -hmm. Well that's uh, all the questions I have here. Any other comments? All right. Okay. Oh how do we know when we have over manipulated inputs like stepping box friction? That's a good question. You want me to answer that or you want to answer it, Grant? Go right ahead. Um, take away your pick well, the, the X, you know, close that screen out right there. Go, go higher. Yeah, okay. Now, if you right. raise the damping factor too high, the pump card becomes concave inward. So, see right there, Carrie Ann has made the damping factor too high on the upstroke. And uh, it, but if when it's flat, fairly flat like that, that's about all you can change. If you make it too low, it's going to concave up on the upstroke or concave inward on the upstroke from sort of the up damping factor. And then on the downstroke, it's going to concave inward if it's too high or concave outward. So this this is a good this is a good example where um, by putting a little bit of um, stuff and box friction, this is as well as paraffin in it. And so the, the only point that we currently have in TAM is the surface, but eventually we'll have an option to put mechanical friction at a point. And so as Carrie Ann were, were to add mechanical friction, it's going to take about the same amount of friction on the upstroke and downstroke. And you may want to look at our first presentation we did that talks about mechanical friction. But uh, normally what the, what the idea is, is, is if the pressure on top of the plunger and the intake pressure below the plunger aren't changing during the upstroke, then the load line is going to be flat if you have the right fluid dampening removed. And so if the, if the pressure is changing throughout the stroke, then the load line won't be flat, either the discharge pressure or the intake pressure. Same thing applies on the downstroke. When the plunger is moving through the barrel on the downstroke and the trailing valve is open, the force on the rods from the pump typically is going to be small unless you have viscous crude. Okay, and there's large pressure drop across the pump. So, so the the concept of over adjusting means raising the damping factor high to remove mechanical friction. That's really not modeled by the wave equation. Mechanical friction typically is at a point versus versus velocity, 
And so damping factor is a function of the velocity of the, of the rods. The faster the rods go, the higher the damping force on the rods is. Whereas mechanical friction, which is uh, over a section or over a point, is 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 a, a damping coefficient times times the the weight of the rod string, the normal weight of the rod string acting on the side of the tubing. So, so there, there, there are two different types of forces. One force is damping from the fluid, which is handled by a damping factor, and it means that you shouldn't make the damping factor in the upstroke or downstroke too high or too low. The load line should be flat because it represents the pressure acting across the plunger during the upstroke or the downstroke. And that, that pressure differential is going to be about, about con reasonably constant for most wells. Um, anyway, that's, that's, a, that's the answer. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Well, um, thank you, Lynn and Dr. Podio and Gustavo for um, another great session. And we sure thank all of you for joining us today for the great questions and feedback. We hope you learned something new or picked up some new tips. And in the event you have any follow-up questions, we, of course, always welcome your calls and emails. Um, next week, we're looking at probably doing something um, along the lines of this workshop, but with, flu with uh, for fluid levels, talking about some of the uh, fluid level guns and equipment and having a, a fluid level workshop. So we'll look at lots of data. We'll talk about acquisition and knowing when you have good quality data. And so I, I think that'll... That'll be really good, and we're looking forward to that. We certainly appreciate you guys for joining us today. We'll uh, look forward to seeing you again next week, and have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you.